you know, to, to speak again to the concept of being done, I know you've acknowledged there's a difference between somebody who's maybe, you know, in their 90s or hundreds who says they're done. And there's sometimes people who have been diagnosed with a terminal illness like dementia or Alzheimer's who are still in their 70s or 80s. And sometimes their reaction is, okay, I'm done. How can I die? <laughs> you know, but I mean, but it's, I don't feel that it's always entirely serious because they could still end their own life if they wanted to. Um, but I don't think they really want to. It's, it's so complicated, as you know. You know, I, what I love about people who are living with dementia is often that they are really present in the moment and they have pretty clear access to emotion and there's not much in the way. Like a lot of their social filters are gone. Um, a lot of their worries about self-consciousness are gone. And so it's easier to just sort of connect on a deep level more quickly for me with them than it is with a lot of other people. How does it work? What do you do to connect? You know, I do a lot with eye contact. So often in our society, we don't make prolonged eye contact mm -hmm. with people who we don't know very well. That's reserved for close, you know, people who are very close to us. It makes people uncomfortable, you know, often to have prolonged eye contact. But what I learned early on is that people who are living with dementia, in a way, they're just really not getting that from anybody and they're missing it. And it gives them a signal when I make prolonged eye contact with them. I'm not staring. It's not, I'm not being intense or pressuring them, but I'm not looking away too quickly. And, and I think it sends a signal to them that here's somebody important, here's somebody who cares, here's somebody I can feel close to. Mm -hmm. You know, there's also a, a rule of politeness in our culture that if somebody's disabled, we don't stare. You know, mm -hmm. our mothers tell us, don't stare at them. Someone's in a wheelchair, don't stare. Or if they look like something's different about them. Um, but I think that leads to people also feeling invisible. Um, so that's another reason why I think it's important to make that eye contact and to keep it and to maintain it um, without making the person uncomfortable again, of course. Uh, and then there's one other aspect to this, which is that people who are living with dementia often have slower processing time. So they can't always respond quickly to words or even to facial expressions. So maintaining eye contact gives them a chance to process and then to respond in their own time. You know, so if you say to someone, how are you today? And then you look away and you move on to the next thing. Oh, it's such a beautiful day. And, you know, it doesn't give them a chance, even a ghost of a chance to really respond. Well, that really goes culturally to our sort of pro forma way of responding to life generally. I mean, when we say, how are you today? We don't really expect or care in some respects about the answer. It's just more a greeting and then move on. Yeah, right. So another thing I've learned is to say, how are you today? Or how are you right now? And then to really wait for an answer and indicate with my body language that, I, that I'm willing to hear a real answer. And people with dementia can handle the question and respond adequately? Yeah, I mean, you know, of course there's a real spectrum. Mm -hmm. There will be people who can no longer speak. And I don't, you know, if that's a different group of people, but many people living with dementia 
for years and years can still talk and still have a two-way communication, even if it's not a normal conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you had mentioned in a previous conversation that oftentimes you may get a non sequitur in your mind, even though it may be perfectly sequential in their mind. Right. Well, as we talked about, you know, one of the things that I really am working through is the whole perspective of what are you to say to somebody who says, I'm done, mm -hmm. especially in, in advanced old age. They just, there's nothing else to give. Um, and some of the response, again, was the idea of attention relationship and sitting with, but mm -hmm. somehow that doesn't acknowledge to me an ability to make connection. Mm. You know, I've been thinking about this one man that I briefly knew. Mm -hmm. He was over 100 years old. And um, this was in San Francisco a few years ago. And he was done. He really, he truly was done. And I was introduced to him as, you know, someone who was going to be a visitor. And he was not open to that. He, he really didn't, he really didn't have any need or desire to meet a new person. And he made that really clear. And so I didn't impose on him. But I, I said to him, you know, I heard that you love opera. And he said, yeah, but I like the old, the old opera. My favorite singer was, you know, from the 1920s. Mm -hmm. And I can't, you know, nobody's heard of him. Nobody knows where to find him and um, his music. And, you know, that's really the only opera I'm interested in now. And um, he couldn't even remember the singer's name. But I've been through this process with a few people where I don't give up and I search and I search and I try and I, is it, oh, is it this person? Is it this person? Um, but we did find, we did find the singer and I was able to get the music and to play it for him when we were together. So that's all we did. I didn't, I didn't um, try to force a relationship. We just, I would come and turn on that music and we would listen to it and he would be in his world with the music and I would just be more of a witness, you know, just more of a person, a presence. And, um, and I think that was, that was enough. On uh, the presentation yesterday that we saw, uh, one of the things that uh, Dale had said was that uh, there come to a point where people who are so used to giving need to shift to receive, mm. which I thought was a very profound statement that he made. Um, mm. And what it sounds like you're saying is with this hundred year old man, you, he was there and he was not interested in giving, not interested in participating. That was all just more than he wanted. But the minute you offered him something that he could receive, mm. as you say, that was enough. It's a nice way to put it. Tell me the other story you have. There's a woman that I worked with for several years as she progressed in her dementia. In the beginning of our relationship, she would just tell me stories for hours. She had a need to tell all her stories. And they were wonderful stories because she had been an actress and in the theater and knew so many people and had so many adventures. And then as the years went on, she lost more and more of those stories, or at least the ability to tell them. Um, and she became quieter and quieter. Uh, but one time I brought her to the library. We both have a love of art, she and I. And she had a large collection in her apartment of art books, books about different artists that she had collected. But she was still interested in more. So we would go to the library in Berkeley to the art section where they had these big beautiful oak tables and hundreds of art books and you know we would sit there but and she would then one day she said to me there's this artist i think he's from vienna and that's all she said <laughs> <laughs> 
And so I, I, you know, I, I listed a few famous ones. She said, no, no, no. And then I looked on my phone and I just put in, you know, to Wikipedia, Viennese artists, and there was maybe 200 names. <laughs> and we made it into this game and we were both laughing. You know, I would say this name, you know, this name, this name, this name. And she, no, no, no. And, and I had no idea if she actually had a name in mind that she could remember. Or we were having fun and we went through this list and we kept cracking up and no, no. And then I got to this man named Hundert Wasser. And I, and I, you know, I said, is it Hundert Wasser? And she goes, yeah, yes. <laughs> and so I went to the shelves and I found a Hundert Wasser book and I brought it to her and she was in heaven. It was him. It was him. And he was a crazy artist that I had never heard of before. And his work was amazing. And I discovered a whole new artist. And she was, she had this wonder, I could tell she had that same feeling as the, the man with the opera singer, like someone sees me, someone, someone cares, someone understands. Mm -hmm. And I got what I needed. I, uh, regular every Wednesday afternoon at three o'clock, I get on the phone. Woman's 95, same age as my mother. Um, but all of this was something where we started on one of those Wednesdays doing what she called a tour. So we're on the phone. She's not seeing anything, even though she has a Zoom account and she joins us for other things. We're on the phone. She says, I'd like to go to take a tour. And so we would go to places where she had done art, like uh, in this case, Soling, Switzerland. And then I would describe what I see and she just seems to be transported. And then she would start talking about names of these famous people that she had met that had influenced her in her life. So I um, started because I'm sitting here at my computer, I'd just Google the name and then I'd go through and then finally, I could find the name and she goes, oh, yes. Yeah. And I didn't know if he was still with his wife. Well, his obituary, because she knew he had died earlier. His obituary says, yes, his wife of 57 years. Oh, I'm so relieved. <laughs> you know, those kinds of things that it's drawing those connections. You're absolutely Oh, I love right. doing that detective work with people. It's so satisfying mm -hmm. For, mm -hmm. for them and for us who are, who are, in this relationship now and, and honoring their histories. Well, as you say, they want to be seen. Yeah. Acknowledged. Yeah. And to know that all of that is still there, even if they can't touch it or see it or remember it clearly, it still exists. It's still there. It's been recorded. It's not being mm -hmm. lost. Have you got other things you would like to share or talk about? You know, just, to speak uh, again to the concept of being done, I know you, you've acknowledged there's a difference between somebody who's maybe, you know, in their 90s or hundreds who says they're done. And there's sometimes people who have been diagnosed with a terminal illness like dementia or Alzheimer's who are still in their 70s or 80s. And Sometimes their reaction is, okay, I'm done. How can I die? <laughs> you know, but I mean, but it's, I don't feel that it's always entirely serious because they could still end their own life if they wanted to. Um, but I don't think they really want to. It, it's so complicated, as you know. Well, it is um, complicated. <laughs> So there are people who I work with who say they're done, but I think I feel from them what they're really asking me is, am I done? And so when I hear, when I, when I sense that question, no matter how old the person is or who they are, or what their diagnosis is, when I sense that they're asking me, am I done? I feel that there's an opening there for me to say, maybe not. You know, maybe this is another part of your journey that you never expected, never wished for, but maybe the journey's not done. 
and maybe you're not done and maybe there's still something here for you and for me you know meaning for your family for your community for the people who interact with you you know we value productivity in this culture so highly that if someone can't be productive you know they often feel like they're done like okay you can get rid of me now you know i don't want to be a burden you hear that over and over again i don't want to be a burden or i don't want all my money to go to waste on my care i'd rather leave it to a charity or to my grandchildren um i don't want to be you know kept alive when i can no longer function physically take care of myself or even recognize you or talk to you you know so as a doula when i have my doula hat on then i can say so what are the things that you you know what are the where is your threshold of when you would still like to be kept alive and not you know and i'll, I'll never forget that story I, I i'm sure it's circulating around this community for years now i can't remember where i heard it in one of my trainings um you know, of, of the man who said, as long as I can watch football and eat chocolate ice cream, I want to be kept alive. <laughs> and that was his threshold. He said, when I can no longer do those two things, then I will be ready to go and you can feel fine about getting me off life support or whatever it is. Um, and he was really clear about that. And not most people are not that clear. No, well, that's true. And, you know, I, as you know, I've talked to people who are legitimately done. I mean, yeah. and it's because the loss that they have endured is so profound. And there's, there's nothing they feel they have left to give, which is exactly the kind of thing you're talking about. But there's also nothing left for them to receive. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. And we talked about, you know, so do you just, but you don't leave them alone in a room. No, no. You sit with them. Right. You sit with them and you, and you join with them and you don't try to convince them otherwise. You, you grieve with them. You right. wait with them. You grieve with exactly. them. You wait with them because they're waiting mm -hmm. and it's hard to wait in that case. But then, then there are also those like you were talking about where your legacy doula would be an important element that, yeah, there is in in legacy. There's more giving, but there's also the element of receiving. You know, it's so interesting that, and maybe we'll end with this story. Um, I was asked to work with a man who was another man who was over one hundred, still lived at home with private caregivers, and he had had a, a really you know full rich life as a professor, an author, wonderful marriage, children, grandchildren. And he, and he did truly feel that he was done and he was just waiting for death and it was hard to wait. But he said to himself, you know, well, maybe, you know, maybe I'll try painting. I love, I love uh, art and, you know, maybe I'll, I'll try doing some painting while I'm waiting for death. <laughs> and so, you know, someone had heard that I do art and they brought me in and, um, you know, I, I sat with him, brought out the materials, talked to him about the art that he loved and what did he want to create and, you know, talked to him about colors and shapes. And um, we were looking at Matisse and talking about Matisse, Matisse's use of collage and paper cutouts. Um, you know, and the fact that Matisse did some really incredible art when he was very old and um, disabled himself. But after three or four sessions, this man said to me, you know what, I, I just, I, my heart is not in this. I can't, I just don't want to do this. And, and it was, you know, it was sad for me. Um, I felt that maybe somehow I had failed and I, I questioned, you know, did I do something wrong or, you know, but I had to let it go. I had to, I had to say, okay. And I had to say goodbye. But then a year or more later, I saw that after that, after my meetings with him, he had, his grandson had made a documentary film 
about him, with him. And it was a project that they did together that was very meaningful and very beautiful. And, and that's what was meant to happen. And then he died right after that, right after making that film with his grandson. So I wasn't the right person at that time, but his grandson was the right person. And he did have that experience, I think, that he was looking for.